So, with the consciousness of, and, and maybe this is something that arose out of an I seeing perspectives, but there are different modes of being, and each type is a mode of being. So within a community, if you're in one community, you might have one type and one role. These things are both going on at the same time. And hopefully, <clears throat> for individuals, the role that they receive is their actual type, if there is such a thing. If the map is good enough to be describing the territory well enough, those things would line up. So by that I mean somebody comes in, say an INTP comes to be typed by a community and they're typed INTP. So they're expected to be themselves, ultimately. That's the ideal. However, I think I've seen instances where I'm not sure that's going on. And there may be people entering new groups who are typed wrong, given the wrong stereotype, given the wrong expectations, and therefore given the wrong job when it comes to using these things as workplace methodologies or tribal identities. If you give someone the wrong job and the wrong expectations, that can cause an incredible amount of pain when you're expected to be something by the only group or groups that you're around or in. And that can totally happen. And then <clears throat> there can be an internalization of not being able to be yourself. And I've, I've seen this in INFJs. I've seen it in ESTPs. And those are two, even though they're a duality, they're two very different types. I've seen it in ENTJs. I've seen it in ISFPs, another duality, still very different. So <clears throat> there can be something that happens where there's an internalization. This probably has more to do with childhood trauma than typology specifically, but people can be, be, people can become habituated to not being seen as who they are and not being seen, I mean, within a hexadecimal typology perspective, not being seen for the right type. <clears throat> so they may even be resistant in some sense to being truly typed the right way. And there could be a lot of that going on as well. And if you see that sort of stuff happening, you understand how often that can happen. You can look into certain socions, <clears throat> certain social groups from the outside, I think it's possible to see individuals who are typed incorrectly by the group. They're seen as something that they're really not. They're willing to do it, and they might be able to do the job okay, but ultimately what's going on inside of them is an incredible amount of pain because they're in a role that is not really naturally theirs. <clears throat> that can happen in typology just as much as any other group. And I would, I would hope to say that, well, it happens in typology less because self-awareness is higher. But I think once you get certain... certain members who are held as experts 
and certain people who are top dogs of any type, they become the ones who dictate the truth and they're the ones controlling the narrative. And just because they might know a lot about the theory doesn't really make them experts of seeing what people's types are by looking at them and paying attention to them. They might really be horrible at that. <clears throat> Ideally, within typological communities, people would have a better typological understanding when it comes to the practical aspects of what we're actually expecting people to do, how we're expecting people to be, and ultimately how we're assessing the value of individuals as human beings based on who they are and what they're doing. But if it's seen that in typological communities that's not happening any better than people who have no understanding of typology. And theoretically, there's not really a group that would have no understanding of typology because there are going to be TI typological valuers. And they might not call it typology, but there is that sort of beta quadra stereotyping going on um, and alpha quadra. <clears throat> There's alpha quadra stereotyping too of inside and and outside, although the, I think in a, a true alpha group, alpha quadra group, there's a lot of permeation available because there's a spirit of the more the merrier, which, which doesn't seem to happen in gamma and delta quadra um, so much or at all. <clears throat> So, but there's still a defense of certain kinds of ideas what am I really saying here If I'm trying to talk about everything I know about MBTI and Socionics from a zoomed out view, I want to make an overarching, or I'm tempted to make an overarching statement about the entire study itself and what it does to people. Um, but I really can't stereotype that one way or another. But one thing I'm observing is that the realities are relative. And that forming an underlying TI structure, understanding, of how a lot of different groups do typology I think it's possible but, but ultimately coming back to specific groups about maybe what I perceive as my meta MBTI understanding It's first of all hard to put into words, and second of all, I'm not sure if it's even possible to talk about. One, because it's a nebulous understanding. And two, because there is a certain amount of mirroring, at least linguistic mirroring needed to enter groups in the first place. You don't go to a foreign country and speak your alien language unless you have some kind of undeniable superpowers that 
establish your dominance. Many times when you go into a foreign country, you're at the bottom and at the bottom of the pyramid and they expect you to be a certain way. There is a certain diplomatic immunity though if you're coming to the pyramid from the outside. But there still is a language that's expected to be spoken from wherever in the pyramid you enter. Sometimes there's different dialect or different language spoken by the high priests who control every society, every pyramidal society from the top or you're trying to speak to the common person or something. <clears throat> if you care about finding, or if you care about dominance and power in any form, you'll probably be looking for the key decision maker, which is probably someone who's considered an expert in the field. I guess here, <clears throat> I find myself being vague because I think I'm getting into some of the practical applications of using typology to do certain things, to move through the world. There's the discussion of typology that might be at its core an Alpha Quadra event where it's really done for intellectual stimulation. Maybe that's an S-I-N-E thing. I see Alpha Quadra as the forum where ideas are discussed for their own intellectual merit, not their practical merit. But once you get into Beta and Gamma Quadras, <coughs> These things have to work. They can't just be fanciful ideas. They have to actually do something. And there have to be, they have to move people, either the ideas themselves or the use of the ideas. That's like a right and left hand thing. The ideas themselves moving people is a right handed thing. But the concepts understood by individuals who are looking to ultimately move towards what they want can be a left-handed thing. And by left-handed I mean that which is done covertly rather than overtly. And to me, cognitive functions have really opened up an understanding of all the things that are done in a left-handed manner. And you can start to see through certain people, maybe, see through certain types, perhaps even looking at their <clears throat> hidden agenda, third slot. But there's still a lot of nuance understanding functions in that slot or any slot. <clears throat> there are a lot of environments that well, I guess when it gets into competitive environments, which I see chiefly as a beta quadra thing, and then maybe gamma beyond that, where <clears throat> understanding of these things are really valuable. They're very, very competitively valuable. So to talk about the specifics of them 
very likely going to be specific and strategically specific based on the environment that they're used in and might only be valuable if that specific environment is on the table being discussed. So <clears throat> if Alpha, Alpha Quadra forum style discussion of typology, that might be sort of like the sorting hat stage of typology. And then beyond that, it becomes... something else. Beyond that, it becomes... <clears throat> more, I don't know if I want to say more dangerous, but there's, and, and maybe I, I'm just referring to the NISE access. It's like, if you're going to use typology to advance and move things, things are going to change. Things are going to change in your own mind. Things are going to change in the world because you can't change something in your own mind without your experience of the manifestation of it becoming different as well. You can absolutely use MBTI and socionics and understanding of cognitive functions to affect the world around you. And understanding the ontological significance of the cognitive functions will give you a command of the environment that is extremely valuable in a lot of fields, for one. And despite its prevalent prevalence and popularity, <clears throat> I don't know how much of it is actually discussed about the real meat and the real, like, use cases of this simple hexadecimal typology. If it really is an ontology, if it really is describing something so deeply that it would encompass any situation, implementation of it is very powerful. So that's probably why I fear and foresee implementation of it becoming a really important thing. And then there is <clears throat> certain things come up um, with understanding social value based on certain types. Ideally, all 16 types are seen as equal. I think that's probably the probably the point and, and maybe the intention set by Isabel uh, Briggs Myers self-typed INFP um, that's harmonizer clarifier there seems to be something ideal about that in the intention and I do say that because an INFP ultimately divides that it's based on that kind of INFP idealism Everybody's equal. All types are equal. But that doesn't always happen, and there's going to be specific environments where some of the stereotypes are going to be enforced, perhaps by Beta Quadra movements, and some types are going to be favored over others. And hopefully, they would be favored over others for specific jobs and for, for specific environments where <clears throat> they're really well placed 
for the freedom and happiness of the individual. But this has some of the same risks involved as anything else. Even if you have a system where you're stereotyping 16 types of people and they're all equal, in practicality, different groups are going to handle things different ways. So pod layer, for one, I observed a movement in there. First of all, they, they <clears throat> took hexadecimal terminology of the types and used them. They made their own language up uh, for, like, I can't remember. There was, like, Nyji and, and things like that. And, and they were named after the specific cognitive functions of the type, the first two cognitive functions of the type primary function and tool function. Um, but what happened over time was uh, the, the leader of that group, which was uh, it has been described as a cult by some, a cult, not a cult, the leader of it was an INFJ within Myers-Briggs terminology and there's even like he does these movements he kind of disappeared from the internet but he's still around if you look for him there's these movements and he, he will I think he calls cognitive functions his spirits it's really fascinating actually but one thing that happened in that was INFJ became a rank and then at first it seemed like certain other people around were other types, but then as they become more respected in the organization, their type changed as a ranking thing, which is not the point of typology in the mainstream sense. But that could absolutely happen to typology in the mainstream sense. Because, you know, it's quite possible that some of the biggest faces, some of the biggest brands for specific types, it's not really their type. And that messes the whole thing up in a TI sense. But in the, in the practical sense, it's like this is, <clears throat> this is what could happen, is happening, and in the future could get even worse. Because everything with the Internet, and I experienced this uh, quite frequently, is you can get so much feedback. with social media, the actors are going to rise to the surface. So the stereotypes, and there's, there's a certain beta quadra competitiveness about this. So maybe the, you know, it's like, I, I guess maybe I'm imagining a world in the future that could happen where every type is a stereotype and acted by some human, ultimately, some, some human actor puts on the, there's, there's the ISTP actor that shows the world what an ISTP is really like. There's the ESTP actor that shows the world what an ESTP is really like. There's an ENFJ actor, there's an INFJ actor, there's an ISTP actor, and there's like these 16 images of, of what the types really are, but those types could be played by anybody. There could be ENFJs playing all of them. And then our understanding of what that is turns from a typological understanding underneath <clears throat> into an understanding of stereotypes. And then once we have the understanding of stereotypes, whatever happens with the stereotypes, which includes the, the notable top dogs of each type, if they're not really that type, which they not necessarily are, if they aren't necessarily, um, maybe I say that out of distrust of, of the average Joe or something, or, or consensus realities. Um, I doubt the conversion of 
of the theory into real practicality that everybody sees because I don't know if that ever happens with politics, which is what ultimately a lot of this becomes. Um, once the stereotypes are in place, which they already are in a certain sense, they're not really formulated, but that's starting to happen with type policing, that's starting to happen um, And there might be some other things out there doing it, I'm not sure. But <clears throat> once these stereotypes are in place, what kind of effect is that going to have on individuals? And of course the stereotypes already exist because type descriptions already exist. But but the simplicity of, of type descriptions might come down to might come down to a simplicity as like one of one one person being the top dog of everything. And you know what? It's it, it doesn't even necessarily have to be a problem of that there could be actors playing stereotypes and they don't represent all of truth they could be just that one person out of each type arises as ultimately a good example but they could become a stereotype of the group that or a stereotype of the type that ultimately leaves out major information or there's someone who who is like a weird subtype of the type that becomes seen as what the type really is. Maybe my biggest drawback um, <clears throat> and my, my biggest concerns about the theory or the practice or the, the study as a whole is the pain of identity at all that may or may not have anything to do with needing typology to get there. There are other things to do. There's a, there's, a, there's a pain of identity and self-awareness. And it's gr very... very complex and complicated and I feel like I'm saying absolutely nothing here. I will say though, uh, early when I started this channel, I have a lot less of a doomsday view of things and I wonder why that is. when I try to imagine worst case scenarios about what could happen with typology, I don't see them as much as I did before. And part of that might just be because I know people listen to that. There's not a hundred billion views on those early videos I did, um, especially one about transhumanism. Maybe I fear that less or just haven't been looking at that as much. Maybe I'm more keen to cybernetics. There's, there's certainly something about me that seems like, like <clears throat> I was trying to discern what is the real agenda um, with hexadecimal typology. 
what is the real agenda and what is what is ultimately the real value of getting these types all together getting people typed correctly getting everything organized correctly and perhaps there's not an agenda at the beginning it's just a raw resource and it might be a different agenda than Isabel Briggs Myers had 50 years ago or whatever to make like 16 groups of expectations for people in some sense I guess it's like now that it is a valuable resource and now that there is some kind of consensus about what things are and if the stereotypes are relatively true good enough then what's the agenda like what is my agenda with it and what are other people's agenda with it what can it be used for it can definitely be used for cybernetics for one and in there I can get some <laughs> doomsday views because I don't think that's going to work for a lot of people it could definitely be used against a lot of people and there's there's not a moral test necessarily that you have to take to get into technology technology moves so fast that <clears throat> it's either I mean, it, it's hard to discern if big tech developments, especially those that have to do with cybernetics and artificial intelligence and ultimately things that can get people to do stuff, it, it's hard to discern whether it's in a force state or in a flow state. Like it's moving so fast. A lot of parts of it move really, really fast. Is it because there's force and no morals taken into account so it's like ultra pragmatic super te fi you know the unbalanced way towards te than fi it could be that or it could be it's, it's so interesting and the information metabolism flows so well that that's why it's agile that's why it's fast and that's maybe sort of a fe thing I've been sitting on the on the on the brink of personality softwares ultimately and it's like viewing myself as a personality software viewing myself as a series of software distributions in my personal evolution or the evolution of my personality thinking about my own survival the old question from one of the episodes of C-Lab 2021 like would you put your brain inside of a robot <laughs> is something that maybe that's a big thing that I'm dealing with and it's not it's not just in a theoretical alpha quadra intellectual simulation way it's like there's the feasibility of doing it becomes more and more realistic where the world is at and where i'm at in the world And I can feel that, especially because certain things in the environment and also certain competitive realities and also things that I want to do to connect with other specific individuals. there's a choice point here whether or not to really 
take everything I know with MBTI and Socionics and move into the world of cybernetics and move into the world of, <clears throat> in some sense, creating a technological homunculus. Counting the cost of this has taken years, but in the simple contemplation of it, the fact that it stays on my mind attracts me closer and closer to the cliff where something is going to happen with this. It attracts me too and it attracts other things to me. And maybe I want to make the same point that I did a few years ago. Everything I know about MBTI and Socionics, what do I ultimately think it's for? It's ultimately for being able to model our brains enough so that we can survive beyond humanity. And there's a certain confidence or arrogance about mankind or certain parts of mankind. Or paranoia of mankind that sees it necessary to do such a thing in order to survive. We're seeking, especially in tech, Epiphenomenon. Epiphenomenal experiences. Can you put your mind and your personality and in MBTI and Socionics, the, the <clears throat> correlation between the two is very well understood. Can that be transferred to something else? another embodied, another body, ultimately. Metempsychosis is reincarnation. That's like a spiritual concept. Evolution is a biological way of transferring consciousness, which may ultimately be that which flows through the cognitive functions, which is the mechanics of information metabolism. Tech and automation have its own mimicking of this. And it's in a certain sense very reverent to biology. But my question is, is automation really just trying to beat biology at its own game? It seems like a losing script. Just my intuitive take on that. How can it be tested on a small scale? <clears throat> My first solution to this, and I still I'm not sure if anyone is working on it, is a socionic method or a cognitive function based method of creating AI. I don't know how much that's done. Sure, Facebook can use, you know, like Cambridge Analytica when those things came out. Um, you could see what the type or what type you were um, labeled as in their system because they were using algorithms to get a four-letter type. 
not cognitive functions, though. I'm not sure if cognitive functions were taken into account. But once they are, and if those things can be seen and detected in you, then it seems like human minds can be modeled beyond stereotype. There's something way more dynamic about cognitive functions. And once that happened, and it could already be happening, uh, then you can have human beings that really sound real. We've got the slow drip disclosure, maybe, you know, conspiracy theorists would call it slow drip disclosure, but it's ultimately like from a development standpoint, like you don't see everything in the lab until it's done and comes out. Even if you've got like social media promotion of, of how you're working on things, there's still things hidden for a competitive advantage among other things. <clears throat> um, you know, Sophia in Saudi Arabia. You know, there there are certain things that we notice about <laughs> AI right away, which is they can seem they can seem intelligent and they can also seem evil. There's not really a vision in them for world peace or peace with humans. One big reason about that is because the people making it aren't ultimately allied to human beings. And that might be a big conflict that's going on. <laughs> and in that, I guess it, it's a very, it took me a long time to do it, but I'm tempted to name an enemy in that which is not faithful to humanity as a species. I can come down to semantics too. But we still have a division and a collective understanding of what's human and what's not, I think. That's everything I know.